this one as uh, inverse, and this one as the neutral. After neutral elements, right? This is this is clear, right? This is a, a way in which we we can use this language to interpret these things. Now, I... yeah, I mean you've been recorded for a while, but there was no sound, but okay. Now let's <laughs> get on to it. Okay. Is that working? I can tell you, but I very much think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will show. I will uh, move another computer and I'll take it. Okay. So, right. Every group, of course, is canonic and LG structure, but the converse, of course, is not true. I can I can interpret those symbols in whatever way I want. This is not because I I call this language the language of groups. <laughs> I am forced to give you LG structures as groups for the moment. This is just, we need to give just an interpretation for these symbols, but nothing is forcing me for doing so. So perhaps let me put it like this. Not every LG structure, oops, is a group. Let me give you some silly examples of this. And when one can take for example, the following structure, we can take M to be uh, Z, and I need to tell you what these symbols should be, right? But I can take anything. I can take this uh, as the function, for example, sending AB to AB, for example. I can take, oh, no, perhaps this, no. Let me take it to, well, okay. Let me take it to, to this one, for example. Perhaps this function, I can take it now to be also something silly, right? Uh, sending A to minus three to the, perhaps a constant function, right? Minus three, and then one to be just, for example, the element seven, right? This is just a possible structure. I'm just taking one possible function uh, uh, of arity two in in this set. Any constant, it could be a constant function, doesn't matter, and just one interpretation for my distinguished element. And this is going to be, this is an L structure, right? An LG structure, which is not a group, right? Definitely not a group. Not a group. But of course, if we want to study groups, perhaps this is going to be the right language to study groups as structures, right? As, as structures in a given in a given language. And of course, there's going to be a way in which we can totally restrict to LG structures, which are going to be groups. But for that, we need to speak about formulas, which I haven't done so far. Okay. So for the moment, we have only defined what languages are and what structures for a given languages are, right? It's just a non-empty set together with an interpretation of each of the function of the symbols that I give you in the language. This is nothing, nothing too difficult, right? Are there any questions about this? If you want to study the category of groups. Yes. I assume everything is a set, so you're, you're you want to work categorically, right? You want to use like a, a group as a as a as a group object or something like this. This is what your your question is, or? That's correct. That's correct for the. That's that's correct. In 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 a way, everything that I'm talking about are going to be sets. The cardinality doesn't matter, but you can think of this as working in, in a small category, right? That's correct. Um, yeah. So we cannot do the category. 
Well, you can, you can, I will, well, right. I, I, I can totally, well, each group is going to be a, a set, I agree. Uh, but I can talk about the class of all groups as the way you're trying to think about the category of all groups. And this is going to be defined a little bit later in the, in the course as the class of L structure satisfying some set of formula. And in this way, you're going to get exactly the, if you wait to get the category of groups, all, all of them in a, in a class, in a proper class, right? But to do so, I need to define what the maps are. If you're already talking about a category, I should give you what the maps between these objects should be, right? The, the, universe the universe is a set, but the, the, for, for a given structure, I mean, this is just one particular group, right? And the class of all those structures that are going to satisfy a given action, this is, per, this is perhaps the category of all groups, right? That's correct. But for a given, right, I mean, one fixed structure is definitely not the whole category, but it's just one specified distinguished group. That's correct. Okay, in the, in the notes, um, in the notes, I say something which is going to happen a lot in the Blackboard is something a bit silly, but let me give you just an example of this. Uh, and this is something I, I try to do in the notes, uh, trying to distinguish it with bold and unbold, but I'm not going to be able to do so here in the Blackboard. For, for example, if I take this structure, Take the LG structure, the reals, this is my L, L structure, the reals uh, without the zero, right? The actual multiplication, the actual inverse and one, right? But this is, this is already the interpretation in, of the symbols in this set, right? This is the actual real multiplication. This is the actual real one uh, minus one. And this is the actual one of the reals, right? And in this case, well, I'm using the same symbol and the same symbol we use for the notes, uh, this, this, this operation, right? This is going to happen a lot. I'm, in the Blackboard, I'm going to use sometimes this thing as a, an, a, the actual formal symbol I'm using in the language, and sometimes as what it should, uh, we as mathematicians use for multiplication, okay? This is something I cannot, uh, well, I could perhaps write in the language something like this, but this is, kind of silly and I, I, I won't do it. We have to bear in mind there is a dif difference between the formal symbol and the one that I wrote here, okay? The same for plus, same for minus, etc. Okay, I'll, I'll try to, to stress when I'm writing which, okay? Okay, so a language already imposes us um, what are going to be the maps perhaps in the category of LG structures, if you want. This is a category which has all the LG structures, not only groups, but every LG structure. But it already tells you what should be an embedding uh, for this, um, for this, well, a map between these two, between two LG structures. So this is L embeddings. So let, M and N, the two L structures for a language L, right? For some language L. Okay, so a map H that goes from the underlying universe of M to the underlying universe of N is called an L embedding. Um, does embedding have two Ds? Thanks, I thought I was doing something right. Uh, if the following holds, um, first it has to be, H has to be injective. Uh, 
And now we need to basically preserve the structure. We need to preserve the symbols or the interpretation of the symbols of n, right? So um, let me, before doing this, write already a notation that we're going to use for the rest of the course, this notation. Uh, if I have a tuple A, A1 up to AN in M to the N, and I have a map H that goes from N to N, I'm going to write H of, we write H of A, of course, to denote the component-wise application of this function. Okay, this is going to be my notation. So, okay, now we have an embedding if this function is injective. Secondly, uh, for a relation symbol in my language of RIT, let's say N, oops, RIT of H is N, then we have the following. If I have a tuple for A, in M to the N, if I have a tuple, if this tuple belongs to the interpretation of this symbol in M, right? This has to happen if and only if its image, yes. A of, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The rarity of this relation symbol is N. I have a tuple in M to the N then this tuple belongs to the relation in M, if and only if its image belongs to the relation in N. Okay, so the relations are preserved, right? If there is something happening here in this relation, its image has to have it as well and vice versa, okay? In a very, exactly. Why is the reason of the finding it so strict? You mean the double implication and not just this one? That's a good question. There, are, this is the way we're going to to. Well, perhaps in 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 the coming um, consequences, you will see you will so see the this. There, there are there are people who study this kind of maps where you only have one implication. Those are called uh, just homomorphisms, but they're less studied in the literature. This is something which is perhaps a little bit, well, you will see why. In particular, this is going to, uh, <clears throat> right, the reason why we're using this is later, we're going to have negation. And negation, we need it to preserve in, in both ways. You're going to see it when we do some uh, results on preservation of formulas, but I haven't defined formulas yet. But this is one reason why. Other people studied this relation, and this is called, instead of embedding a, a homomorphism and one also deletes this injectivity um, condition. But this is the, the notion which is uh, more used uh, in the literature, yes. Okay, for uh, a function symbol, right, for, let me write it directly, G, a given function symbol of my, of my language, uh, let's also have it RIT of this function to be N and some a in m to the n, right? We're going to have basically that um, if I do h of uh, interpretation of this simple g applied to a, right? This is basically they commute, right? This is the same as g n of h of a. Okay, perhaps draw a diagram. This is a simple commutative diagram, right? Here I have m, here I have h with n, right? Here I have, oh, perhaps let me put it this, this way, this is there. This is um, h applied n times, just component wise, right? Here I have my function g to the m that goes to m. 
here I have my function g to the n, right? The interpretation of this function symbol in the structure n that goes to n. And here I have, again, just h. And we're saying that this diagram commutes. OK, so the interpretation of, again, of these two <coughs> symbols commute. And finally, perhaps I, I can put it here. Um, for c, a function, uh, a constant symbol, we must interpret this constant exactly as the image of the constant in, in m. So h of c of m has to be c of n. OK? Right? Is there any question about how this, what, a, what, a, what an embedding is? Let me perhaps. Oh, you're you're totally right. Sorry. Let let me put B's here. Sorry. Perhaps this was confusing with my arity. This is just a. This is just elements from M to the N, right? This is the arity. This is B. Okay, better. Right, the arity was just a, this function, nothing to do with, with this. Okay. Um, if so, two two parts of of, of the definition. If uh, the function h is uh, the inclusion, right? So we have that. M is just a subset of uh, N. Then we say that M is a substructure. Of N. OK, so our definition of being a substructure. So I should perhaps put here an L substructure right, of N. Our definition of being a substructure is just that when I take H to be the inclusion, it satisfies all of this. So the interpretation of the symbols is, is, is preserved in a way. OK? Good. And we write it sometimes, we write it like this. So we put just the inclusion relation, but we write here structures in, instead just of sets, right? If I use the curly notation here and I put subset, this means that M is a substructure of N. And it means that the inclusion or the right the inclusion is a an embedding. Okay. Finally, um, an L isomorphism is a bijective uh, embedding. L embedding. Okay, so. The only thing that we need to impose is that um, we also are uh, surjective. And this is embeddings. And finally, of course, an automorphism <laughs> is simply an L isomorphism from M to M, right? And uh, the set of all automorphisms. Automorphisms of a given structure, of course, L automorphism, sorry, uh, of M, we're going to denote it by automorphisms L in M. Okay, this is just a collection of all possible automorphisms functions from M to M, which are uh, bijective uh, L embeddings. Okay, this is going to perhaps play a role a little bit later. OK. Are there any questions so far? Perhaps I should do a couple of comments on this, which is which are important. Note that um, the language is important to, to understand, perhaps. What Nero was saying is that which 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 actual category are we working in? 
for example, um, this is a couple of observations. Um, of course, nothing prevents me to study perhaps groups in a different language. Perhaps I can consider groups can also uh, be studied in in the language which only contains one binary symbol, right? And I just need to specify, well, this is just the multiplication of the group. And this is actually enough to perhaps present you a group, right? If I give you the multiplication, this is already enough to present you a group. group. Why actually do we care to give this other language where I have the minus one and the neutral element? This is because uh, the language changes the kind of uh, morphisms or embeddings that we have, right? In this language, let me put it like this, however, the LG substructures of a group G are subgroups. But even let me put here the let me put here the one. But the L substructures of a group G are not necessarily subgroups, but just perhaps a, a monoid, right? Because I'm not forced to the minus one relation to be for them to be closed under minus one. Right, I just sub monads. So the type of language we're studying an object is going to determine really the the substructures we're working with. If we work with this language, then substructures are indeed just subgroups. And the usual idea of uh, of group theory of having a a subgroup corresponds here with the notion of LG substructure. Okay, but if we change the language, this might change. The kind of objects we have as substructures. This is not going to be too important or perhaps a, a, a big deal, but it's important to have in mind that the choice of the language changes the, the kind of embeddings that uh, one has. Okay, this is, this is something important to bear in mind. Okay, so now we define, uh, now you can consider, for example, at least the category of, uh, if you want, of L structures for a language L. You have the structures and the maps are L embeddings. This gives you a, one category. This is not the category of groups, but at least we have a category yet to work with. We would like to, of course, now take a nice subcategory of these LG structures to be precisely the category of groups. And we will do so when we study now formulas and we restrict to some structures satisfying a given collection of, of formulas. Any questions so far? Yes. So you said that not every uh, not every uh, um, structure in the language of groups has to be a group. Correct. You know? But if you say that it's a substructure with this uh, a substructure of a, of a group of a group, yes, then it is going to be absolutely. Okay. Absolutely in okay. this language, right? In this language. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So that's why you need it to be so restrictive. Maybe, or well, that's that's one reason, at least for the for the notion of um, well, in the, in this case, it's clear that your your substructure is going to be also closed by uh, by minus one. So the the, the 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 real restriction here, perhaps Javier was pointing out, is is this this if and only if. Perhaps let me give you another example of this. Um, consider just the the. Consider just the language of ordered sets. This is the a language with it only has a binary relation, right? Usually, when you define, for example, uh, an isomorphism of partially or ordered set, you actually need not just that the order is uh, preserved in one direction, but you actually need both. This is how order isomorphisms are defined. This is usually why also you put this this type of if and only if here, right? You, you, you want isomorphism to 
not just preserve the relation in one way, but you want to preserve it in, in, both, in both ways. So this is perhaps one reason why we put such a strong condition here and not just one, one implication, okay? This is one, perhaps one example in which um, we need this kind of uh, a strong if and only if between the, the <laughs> to, to, to be a bijective elementic just, just that, that, that could be another option that could be another option I agree and then you could define then just homomorphisms to be well exactly this way to just with one implication and then change here your isomorphism to be that's that's correct but those are for the moment for the time being these are just different changes of the category we're studying, right? You're just taking the same object, but changing the maps you're studying, right? So I'm going to, for the rest of the course, just working with, with L embeddings, okay? Okay, good. Perhaps I can delete this. I think we have now formulas, uh, structures, isomorphisms, and so now we, we go to formulas. By the way, I, I will, we will put the, the notes or at least the notes up to what we have done in the web page. And I will also put some uh, exercises uh, on the web page so that you can just think of And On Wednesday, we have also a, an exercise session. We can go through some of them if, if you want. Okay, now the syntax. So this is the, a little bit the most, boring part of the of the course i hope we go quickly about it and then we can uh, work with it without going too much uh, um, into the details of this um okay so the first part is variables and terms okay so we let just the, the variables of a language L. This is just purely syntactical, right? This is, this is an infinite set of uh, formal variables, right? This joint from L. It's just a new set of symbols, right? Formal symbols, which is disjoint from my my set L. And for the for the remaining of of this talk, I will take M and N to be L structures. Okay, and we're we're going to fix the L. I fix a language. Oops. L. Okay. Right, a multivariable. So the language L? Yes. Chooses the cardinality of that set. Uh, so infinite is not very precise. Just, you're correct. You're, you're correct. But I, I actually only need countably many uh, variables because every formula is going to be finite and then I'm only going to use finitely many variables in the formula. Right, countably many variables is going to be enough because even if my language is infinite in a formula, I, I'm going to need only finitely many of them. So infinite and alif zero just uh, does the job for every language uh, L, right? So a multivariable is just going to be a tuple of variables, right? X1 up to Xn, right? Where each Xi is an element in my variables of L. This is what we're going to call a multivariable. And sometimes uh, we let, we write this to just write the, the length of the multivariable. So if I put this like this, it's just to denote how many actual variables I have in my multivariable. And of course, I, I'm going to say, oh, right, this is, this is perhaps important. I say that two multivariables uh, 
x and y are different, not if they differ in at least one, but if they are really just, uh, they don't have any component uh, equal. So if xi is different from yj for every uh, ij in one of them. Okay, I'm going to treat them really just as disjoint kind of sets of, uh, of variables. Okay, now we're going to define the terms or the L terms of a language. So the, the length of the... Of these two y. should be equal? Actually, it doesn't matter. Let me say it. I, 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 I could put for every i in one of two x and j in one of two up to y. Doesn't matter. They, they could actually have different lengths and the same will apply. You're, you're right. Okay. So the L terms, this is going to be purely syntactical. So I'm going to define you basically words in a given, uh, in a given alphabet. So is the smallest, collection of words, right? Just concatenation of symbols uh, on the alphabet L union, the variables of L uh, such that the following three things hold. The first is my right, terms one is that, oops, uh, if X is a variable, then X is an L term. So variables are uh, terms. Constants are terms, right? If C is a constant, then C is also an L term. And the last condition is a kind of recursive condition. If, um, T1 up to Tn are L terms. And I have a function symbol with arity N. Then F, sorry, G T1 Tn is an L term. Okay, so I can form terms I act are actually of three kinds. They're going to be either a variable, either a constant, or I have built them up with previous terms and a given function symbol, right? Well, let me give you some examples of these two. Samples. This is something for the moment horrible, but of course we're not going to write this anymore in this course. Let me give you just one, ex a couple of examples, and then later I'm going to tell you that we're not going to do this anymore, but just write usual <coughs> terms in, in, in the way we do. So for example, in the language of groups, right? Then we have uh, something like dot, dot, uh, one X and Y. This is, uh, of course, intended for something like uh, uh, one times uh, X times Y, right? I mean, this is the, the intention <laughs> of this term is something like this, but I am using a prefix notation in the definition of, of, of terms, okay? Of course, I'm going to write in the rest of the course something like this, but I will tell you in a second why this way of defining the L terms is useful, is that it's really straightforward when we define it like this to 
to show that there is a unique way in writing terms. This is just a kind of Polish notation or prefix notation of, right? I'm, I'm not using parentheses in any place in the definition of terms. Of course, we don't write mathematics like this, but this is just one simple way to prove a lemma that I will give you in a second, okay? And why do you think in place that expression as the point you wrote in brackets and not with the parentheses on the, on the other side? Is there another way of parentheses? So, sorry, again, uh, what, what's the question? So, what? so you, you chose uh, in, in that what you have in mind, yeah. the parentheses on the right. Uh, this one? Yes, there you wrote with the parentheses first for x and y. If you well, if dot, if the, the, dot x y is like x, x times y. Huh? Exactly. I mean, this is. And then if you write. Oh, sorry, sorry. I I, I made a mistake, right? I made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I made a mistake. This was. Let, let us see. This is. This this is like this. Oh, you're right. You're right. You this, one by this. Okay. this this is the right one. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. I I I myself don't read prefix notation, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this is this one, of course, right? You're totally right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, of course, um, perhaps this one is also um, an example. Dot dot uh, minus one y y x right, and in this case now, if I try to do things uh, properly, this says y to the minus one times y times x right, something like this. Now I guess the parentheses are correct, but of course I I can also have uh, a term like x, right? All these three terms are LG terms, right? All of them are LG terms. And it's important that this term and this one, even if one would like to say they're the same thing, they're just different as L terms. For the moment, L terms are just uh, concatenation of symbols. They're just words. And if they... <clears throat> If there are different at words, there are different L terms for the time being. All of them are different <clears throat> as LG terms. Okay. The, the 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 way I choose the notation. Yes, I, I'll I'll give you the right away the. <clears throat> no, this, this is just I, I I could have done it directly with this with this other notation using really parentheses, and then I need to put the parentheses also as symbols in my alphabet. But the way I choose it here, it's really easy to prove the following lemma, which we're not going to prove. It's, the proof is going to be included in the in the in the notes. But it says basically that there is a unique way. If you give me a term, there is a unique way in which I could have built this term. There is a unique readability of terms. And to prove this with this notation is is really simple. And with the other notation, it's a little bit more cumbersome. It's not too difficult, but it's easier this way. So, <clears throat> of course, I'm, I, I will give you a way to translate any of these terms in, into what we usually write. And I will never, <clears throat> in the rest of the course, I will never write formulas like this, but just formulas that we actually understand and can read. So, the, <clears throat> the lemma is the following this says unique readability. So every L term uh, is either a variable, a constant symbol, or of the form F let's say G, T1, Tn, for a topple G, T1, a unique, let me say this is the, the point, for a unique topple G, T1, 
T1TN, where G, of course, is a function symbol of parity N and T1TN are L terms. Okay, so basically this says that you cannot have done, uh, you cannot arrive to a term in two different ways, right? You cannot start perhaps with multiplication, then use other symbols and arrive to the same term in a, in a different fashion. There is a unique way to, do, to, to write every single L term. And <clears throat> the point of this is that we can now prove things by induction on terms. Basically, we prove that something is true for uh, variables, something is true for constants, and we assume something is true for these terms Tn and T, T1 to up to Tn, and we prove it for a term of this form. Basically, this is giving us an induction procedure to prove things about L terms, and this is what this uh, unique readability is telling us. Okay, The proof of this is not complicated, and it's given in the in the in the notes it's basically a a tree construction if you want you you're following basically a tree which tells you how how to how to get to the to the lemma so of course this is purely syntactical and we will do a convention to not write things like this but knowing that we can write them and uh, when we write them there is a unique way but we will use a couple of uh, of conventions right of course we write more conveniently, a G of, uh, for example, T1, Tn with the parentheses instead of, uh, instead of just G T1 like this, and we use commas, etc. right? We just, I'm going to use just the, the usual notation of a function and a function symbol that, that we use instead of this, this notation like this. So I'm not going to use this kind of, oops, this kind of notation <clears throat> and in fixed notation, for example, plus A plus B instead of plus AB, right? Things like this, okay? Uh, also, we're going to be a little bit more flexible as well. We're going to write for example, in the language of, if I take the language of groups, but written additively, right? If say my language, let me put additive groups if you want. This is just the language in, in which I'm writing groups additively. And this is just a binary function, a unary function and a constant. Then we write, we write, for example, uh, X minus Y, uh, plus zero, for example, instead of, uh, well, this will be plus zero. Uh, I have a plus, sorry, this is like this. I have minus y, right? Then I have x then I have a plus and then I have a zero here. Something like this, right? If I'm correct, right. I won't write like this, right? I mean, this is, okay, let, let, let me even write it like this. Even before putting it like this, let me put, write, I, I won't write things like this, right? Even if I know that this is a unary symbol, I will allow myself to write things like this in formulas and what follows just knowing that this is an abbreviation for something like this. And this is already an abbreviation for something ugly like uh, stuff that I have written there in prefix notation, but I'm just going to use regular mathematic, uh, mathematics uh, notation instead of using this, knowing that if I want to perhaps put this on a computer, I will write things in prefix notation or something like this, right? Is this clear, more or less? Okay. Okay, now, um, mm -hmm. 
Right. Oh, I need a definition before 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 defining you the, the next thing. I'll, I'll give you an example of how we can define and prove things by induction on, on terms, okay? But let me first give you a definition. Definition. Mm. So let uh, X be a multivariable. And we say, uh, T is an L X term. So it's an L term. Uh, ah, sorry, I need to first define you. Ah, right, sorry. This definition comes after my, my example of uh, definition um, using induction of, of terms. So we define, sorry, we define the set of variables occurring in a term T, in an L term T, we're going to define this B of T. On the complexity of T. Okay, and defining things by induction in the complexity of T is basically just doing these three cases. The basic case of the induction here is treating T as either a constant or a variable. And the inductive step is assuming that we have T1 up to Tn terms. We prove it for a term of the form g t1 up to tn for g a given function sigma, right? So the first case or the base case here has two two parts, right? Part one is if t is um, a variable x, then we define the variables occurring in this term. Well, it should definitely be the set just x, right? This is the only variable occurring in this term, as the term is simply one variable, right? If t is uh, a constant, a constant symbol, then what do you think? How should we define the variables occurring in t? Empty, right? It has none. And finally, if T1 up to Tn are L terms, and we have already defined V of Ti for, or is defined for I1 up to N, and we have G, a function symbol, arity of this function symbol to be N, then we need to define what the number of variables or the set of variables of this new term is, right? And this is completely silly. This is just the union of the variables already occurring in the previous terms as of course here, well, formally we have only attached one given function symbol, but that's everything that we have attached to the, to the term, right? So the previous terms have perhaps variables, but this new term, well, it contains only the variables which are already inside each term T1 up to Tn, right? And this is, for example, a typical, this is already the induction step, right? Inductive step. So usually a, a proof or a definition by the complexity of, of terms has these two, has this form. The base case is just a case in which the term is a variable or a constant symbol. And the inductive step is the one in which we have already defined it for given terms. And we define it for a function applied to these terms, a function symbol. So now let me give you this definition, which is 
um, important. Now let x be this multivariable. Be a multivariable. Now we say an L term T is an L X term and we write it let me put it in parentheses, we write it as you usually write functions, we write it just saying T of X, right? If uh, the variables occurring in T is included in this set of, of variables, okay? So we say a given term is going to be a, an LX term if the variables occurring here is included. It, has, it, it doesn't have to be equal, but it has to be included in the variables X1 up to Xn. Let me give you a hint of why are we doing this. This is exactly the same problem as we have with polynomials. The polynomial X is a polynomial in, let's say, given in over the complex number, the polynomial X plus one is a polynomial in CX. It is also a polynomial in CX1, X2, right? It's a polynomial, one can see it as a polynomial in one variable, two variables, or three variables. And usually one has to specify in which polynomial ring are we dealing with this object, right? Because the polynomial ring in three variables include all the polynomials in two variables. This is exactly what we're, what we're taking this definition like this. The polynomial X plus one, well, is naturally a polynomial in one variable, but I can also treat it as a polynomial in more variables. And then this is precisely this X, the treatment of X here. I would like to see not only a term, potentially as a term, only with the variables it has as the polynomial X plus three, but I would like to see it also as a polynomial, perhaps in three variables. And this is why I would like to treat it as a an L, LX term for a potentially bigger set of variables, okay? This is principally the same problem as one has with polynomials, but with terms, okay? Good, but let me give you an, an example, right? So this term that we were seeing uh, before this was y minus y times y times x is uh, if this is t right we have that the the variables of t are just x and y but i could treat it of course it is also perhaps let me put it here it can also be treated as an x y z term for example and i'm trying to deal with this term as kind of embedded in a larger variable set. So it can also be treated as an L, and here I put X, Y, Z, Z, right? And here I could put just any other collection uh, of variables which is bigger than X and Y. Okay, this is just the the definition. Okay, now we were saying that uh, in the language of groups, for example, this term and just a term with a single variable x were different terms, right? But naturally, if you try to see these terms in a given structure, you directly see if the structure is a group, they define basically the same function, right? In a way. Now I will define you exactly what this means. I am going to attach to every term of a given language, a function it induces on a given structure. Every term is going to define a function in my structure. And in this way, well, two potential different terms might define uh, the same function. Even though, for example, I need to treat, if, if they're going to find the same function, I need to treat, for example, this uh, term here, which only uses one variable, I need to put it in the right ambient uh, number of variables to, 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 to even be meaningless about what I'm, uh, meaning a full uh, about what I'm saying. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the proper definition. I'll explain this um, properly. So 
definition. This, this chalk finishes very quick. Okay, so let uh, x be x1 up to xn and t be an lx pair. We define uh, by the complexity, well, we define a function that we're going, I'm going to denote by t, oh, right. Let M be an L structure. And now we define a function which we call T uh, upper subscript uh, M, right? Upper script M, which goes from m to the n to m by induction on the complexity of t. OK? So we know that we have uh, two cases, the case where t is a variable, uh, the case where t is a constant, and the case where the induction, the induction, inductive step. Let me do this here, perhaps. So, if t is a variable, right? Let me put base, base, base step. Part one, right, is if t is the variable, it has to be one of the variables x1 up to xn because we say this is a Lx term, right? So all the variables occurring in t are among x1 up to xn. So if t is the variable xi, then this function is just the coordinate project projection to the ith coordinate. is the i coordinate projection, right? Sending a1 up to a n to a i, OK? And the second step, we need to deal with the case when this term is a constant, a constant symbol, right? So if uh, T is a constant symbol. Let's say C in the constants of my language. What do you think should be this this function? Any guess? The the constant function, right? Sending everything to to C. Well, to the interpretation of C, right? Correct. Then this sends any a one up to a n the interpretation of this constant in M. So this is the constant, the constant map sending anything and N to the interpretation of CN. Okay. And finally, now we need to do the inductive step, right? Inductive step. So if, if we have terms T1, up to T M uh, if all of them are L X terms for which this function has been defined and G is a function symbol of RIT N. Yes. Of RIT N. Then, right, and T finally 
this new uh, term t is the term g t1 up to tn, then we define t, let me put it like, let me put it here for b, an element in m to the n, we define t of m of b as the interpretation of the function, right? And then applied to t1m of b, tnm of b. Actually, let me, oh, let me put this arity to be m. It has nothing to do with the, with this n. The arity can be any, right? I can have a function with m entries, right? But each of them has an entry of size n, but the, the term can be a, or, or another of another length, right? This m here has nothing to do with the n. I mean, they could be equal, but they're not necessary to. One more. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, good. Right, so this gives you, for every term, uh, an attached function in a, in a structure, right? Then, for example, in this, in this example, right? Of course, let me, okay. This is defined there. Let me perhaps erase this part. So um, consider these two terms in the language of groups, uh, the terms, let me put x1 and x2 so that we, this one, x1 minus one times x1 times x2. Let me call this perhaps T1, right? And T2 could be just X2. Okay. Then of course, uh, T1 is an L X1, X2 term, right? And its function, right? Uh, it's as a... <clears throat> It's associated function in a group on a group, let's say G that we're interpreting. This is, those are the, the actual multiplication, the actual minus one function and the actual one of my group, right? Uh, is simply, well, this T, so let's suppose this is, let me call this curly G. And here I have my curly G. This is a function that has, goes from G squared to, to G. And in this case, this is just a function, well, X2, right? Because we know actually in the group, this is going to be the identity and we know this is only going to be X2, right? However, this term, I can see it as an x1 term or as an x1, x2 term, right? And depending how am I seeing it, I'm going to get a function either from g squared to g or either from g to g, right? And this is why we need to specify in which kind of, in which ambient space of variables I'm treating this term, right? Let me write it this one, even if it might seem silly, it's important to have it in mind. Uh, the term uh, T2 as an L, just X2 term, right? Uh, has an associated, associated function in G, let's say in this, in this uh, group G, Right, I mean, it's just the identity, right? If I have T2 uh, to the G, right? This is just a function from G to G sending A to A, right? It's just the identity. It's just the variable is, is fixed. 
the projection function, but here we have just n. And as an L x1, oh, sorry, these, these L's has to be all, all with L g. As an L x1, x2 term, of course, we have that t1 of g equals t2 of g because they define the same functions, right? So we can have different terms um, that do define the same function in a given structure, even if as, as terms, uh, they are going to be different. And we have to bear in mind the same way, uh, the same way as we do with polynomials, which is the ambient set of variables in which we're treating a given term, okay? Is this clear? Know that perhaps this is this is silly, but let me give you, I mean, this is an analogy with polynomials, but this is really what happens in the language of rings with polynomials. Right. Observation. Let mm. me uh, say let A be a ring. So we see it A as an L ring structure, right? So we were treating these, let's say that we put this A curly A for, for the whole structure. It has a zero one. When I say ring, I'm dealing with unary, uh, unitary commutative ring. So I, I, will, I will always have a zero and a one, mm, right? Then, ah, this is this is going to be important. Um, right. Not every polynomial in let's say A X is an L ring term. And anyone could see why this is perhaps silly, but important to to to, to check. Yeah. Why? Because the elements of A are not constant. Exactly. We we don't have coefficients in this language. I cannot write for every element in A. I don't have necessarily a constant. Have to be one or one. Exactly. Right. We we well. You're right. The coefficient has to be right. You can deal with two because you can you can put one plus one plus one plus one, right? Exactly, exactly. Even perhaps with a right, you you, you can only have integer coefficients uh, in this case. Indeed. Well, let me put it as we can only have integer coefficients. In L terms, terms. So, however, uh, every let me put it like this: every uh, polynomial <coughs> with integer coefficients. is an L term, right? An L ring term. And every L ring term can be seen as, um, sorry, every, right, every integer coefficient is, or can be treated as an L term. And the converse is true. If I have an L ring term, I'm going to have an integer uh, coefficient polynomial, which is going to de actually define the same function in my ring, right? Let me put the converse. And conversely, for every L ring term, there is a polynomial. Oh, let me say there is P, let's say in. But that L ring term is not unique. So like if you're That's correct. There are many. 
That that's correct. So I'm going to there is there is one well. Otherwise, you contradict the Exactly, exactly. But as functions, they're going to define the same function yeah. on A, right? Exactly. Uh, defining the same function. The same function on A. That's correct. So here, if we if we want to. If we want to express now polynomials with coefficients in A, we would need to expand the language with some more constant symbols to give, to have actually all the coefficients of my polynomial group. Uh, defining the same function on this structure A on my ring. Okay. The idea is 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 clear. How, how would you write a polynomial uh, as an L term? I think this is this is uh, easy. And the point here is to to be aware of the of the coefficients, right? Because well, indeed, since we only have zero and one, a coefficient in Z here is something which is going to be of the form one plus one plus one, or perhaps minus one plus one plus one n times, right? And this is those are the coefficients that I'm going to put multiplied by some variables, and this gives me precisely these uh, coefficients in well polynomials with coefficients in in Z. Okay. Good. Any? Oh, let me give you a. This is part of the exercises. Let me give you an exercise here. Perhaps I can I can write it here. Exercise um, so let T be an L X term. So this is a multi multi variable. X is X one of two X N and let H be an embedding. So an L embedding show that the same diagram that I wrote for function symbols applies for terms. So show that for every, now I am writing always B instead of A <laughs> because of the arity. For every b in m to the n, it holds that h of tm applied to b in m is the same as t in n applied to hb. Okay, this is the same commutative diagram I wrote before, but instead of using a function symbol, I'm using a term. Okay, so this says that uh, L embeddings make commute the term and the, the embedding. Okay. So this is a good practice for, uh, it's really not difficult, but it's a way to practice this induction on the complexity of, of terms. This is easily done by induction on the complexity of terms. Okay. Let me check if I have not forgotten. No, okay. So now that we have defined terms, we are finally ready to define formulas and we're almost done with, with all the elements of, uh, let me erase directly this, with all the elements of this first part of the, of the course, which is define structures. We define also the maps between structures. We already defined terms. For terms, we saw how to each term, we can define an associated function uh, on a structure, which we call also the interpretation of this term in the structure. And now I would like to define you now the formulas. Now that when we I fix a language, I'm going to give you what are the formulas that we can build within a language. And of course, this is a first order formula. There are plenty of ways one can define formulas for but for, for what we were going to do, I'm going to define just first order formula. I'll, I'll let you know later what this first order means, but for the moment, let me just 
define it like this. So first order L formulas. So this is, we're going to define it. We're going to play exactly the same game we play with games. I'm going to define formulas again using this prefix notation, but this is not the way we're going to use them in, in practice, okay? So um, uh, the alphabet, or the let, let me say the logical symbols are the following. I'm going to use something like this. This is, these are called the, the true and false symbols, equality, uh, negation, conjunction, and the existential quantifier. These are going to be, for the moment, the only the, the only symbols are going to uh, to use. This is got just called true and false, equality, negation, conjunction, and the existential quantifier. And now we define now first what atomic formulas are. So definition. This is atomic formulas. Okay, so an atomic formula is a word on the alphabet um, L, the variables of L, together with uh, all these symbols, sorry, true, false, and equality. Here, I'm not going to use any of these symbols. So for atomic formulas, I only have this, these three symbols. Uh, right, atomic formulas are word in this language and they're defined uh, as follows. So I should say perhaps it's the smallest Right, let me put it like this, the, the set of atomic formulas is the smallest collection such that, um, let me put this as A1. Well, these two are atomic formulas for a relation symbol of my language of RTN and T1 TN L terms, the word R, T1, Tn is an atomic formula. And finally, uh, if we have uh, T1 and T2 uh, terms, T1, T2 are L terms, then equal T1, T2 is an atomic formula. Okay. And exactly as it happens with terms, one can show that there is a unique readability of atomic formulas. There is for a given atomic formula. Either it is the truth, the false, or there are uh, a unique relation symbol and terms like this, such that the formula is this one, or two unique terms, T1, T1, such that the atomic formula is this one. Let me not write it, but just say it like this. Uh, they satisfy, or well, they also satisfy. A unique readability 
lemma. Okay, so we can write or define atomic uh, formulas in a in a unique in a unique way. Okay, now for the last four minutes that we have uh, uh, in the first part this this morning, I think I can I can quickly define you what in general formulas are, and we we follow the same scheme. So the set of L formulas is the smallest set of words on the alphabet. Now I have L, I have the variables of L, and I have all my symbols. So truth, false, um, equality, negation, conjunction, and the existential quantifier. Uh, such that, and now I have again three three types of formulas. The first type is, of course, atomic formulas. So, formulas one. This is uh, atomic formulas Sorry, I should I should be a little bit more precise. Of course, the set of here I should have put an L formula everywhere, right? Because we're defining formulas for the language L. Later in the course, if I don't put the L, is because L is clear from the context. But for the time being, let me be formal. This is always L formulas, right? And here we're defining right the set of L formulas. So atomic L formulas are L formulas. If uh, phi is an L formula, well, let me perhaps put it like this. If phi and psi are L formulas, Then the negation of phi and conjunction phi psi are also L formulas. And finally, well, actually, I think I can put this also. And also, there exists x phi for x some variable in L. So if these two are formulas, then the negation and this conjunction is our L formulas, but also this one like this. I just attach one quantifier, the existential quantifier, quantifier, a variable, and then a formula, and then this, this is also a formula. And the lemma is again... Uh, no, here just X is just one variable, right. One variable. This is just one one actual variable of of of, uh, of my variable set, and we will write later an abbreviation for what this should mean when x is a multivariable. But we will do this later, and then here we have again a unique readability of L formulas. Okay. So this unique readability of L formulas will allow us to, again, have proofs by the uh, complexity of a formula, right? And then here, the base case is going to be show something that holds for atomic formulas, right? And then we use perhaps the form that atomic formulas have, and then prove something assuming uh, that these two formulas have a property, prove it for the negation, for the conjunction, and for the existential. And then in this way, we're going to prove things for all formulas, right? And this, this is going to be very useful in the whole in the whole course. That's a good point, perhaps, to, to stop, have a break, and then we we continue later. There are other questions. I have one question. Yes. I don't remember the time table. I think we were supposed to have half an hour break okay. and then another two hours. Something like this.
Um, so let me give you again uh, um, an example in which um, we can use this unique readability to prove things by induction on the complexity of formulas. And let's, for instance, define addition uh, given phi. We define the set of three variables of phi, and we denote this by fb of phi. Uh, we define it by induction on formulas. Then defined by induction on formulas has again base step, which is when phi is an atomic formula, right? Phi is atomic. And then we have, well, these three cases, I think I uh, erased the first case of an atomic formula. The first case of an atomic formula was when we were just uh, the truth symbol or, or the false symbol. And if phi is uh, this symbol or this symbol, then we define the three variables of these two symbols just as the empty set. They don't contain any free variable. If phi is of the form, uh, let's say this one, right, is of the form R T1 up to Tn. I'm not going to write again, but this is a relation symbol of arity n and t1 up to tn are terms of my language. Then the free variables of phi, what do you think are these free variables? What should they be? Sorry, the union of the variables of the terms, right? This is just the union of the variables of the ti. Nothing complicated and if phi is just this equality between t1 and t2 then the free variables of b of this phi is just well the variables in t1 union the variables in in t2 and this is how we define then in the basis case in the basis step for uh, the three cases where phi is an atomic formula and this deals with atomic formulas now we do the inductive uh, step and we need now to assume something has been defined for formulas phi and psi and define this set in these three cases that we have here inductive step suppose this set vf uh, is defined for uh, phi and psi, right? So we define it for the negation of phi, right? And in this case, this is, well, the only thing that we have added is one negation symbol. So this is just the same set of free variables as my formula uh, phi. The free variables of this function, uh, of this formula, sorry, what I just added, this symbol, right? So it should be the union of the free variables of the two formulas. So this is the free variables of phi union, the free variables of psi. And finally, the free variables of their existence x phi. What should this be? Exactly. Everything that we had before minus the variable x, but because this variable is now not anymore free. Now this is attached to this quantifier and this should not be a free variable. And this is the way uh, um, an induction definition on the complexity or on the formulas looks like. It has a base step which goes for the three cases of a, an atomic formula and then assuming for formulas by psi, one has to go under these three cases uh, of the induction. Okay, and this is the way we define the free variables uh, of a formula. It's important to see that 
um, not every occurrence of a, of a variable in a formula is free. Okay, so uh, perhaps I should define this um, formally um, like this. Uh, right, perhaps this is a definition. So, um, an occurrence of a variable, let's say uh, x in a formula, let's say an L formula, uh, phi is uh, um, free, right? if um, it does not belong uh, to a subformula that starts with the exist x, okay? Let, let me give you some examples of this because this is perhaps key. So, right, let me write the example here. Ah, perhaps even before the example, I should give you our convention also. Convention, con, our convention of, of writing, of course, Exactly as with terms and with formulas, the way I, I define it is only to be, um, well, to, to make it easier for us to prove these unique readability uh, theorems. But in practice, I won't write formulas like this, right? We, we write uh, phi and psi instead of, uh, of this notation, right? Phi, psi. Uh, I'm going to write, for example, T1 equal T2 instead of uh, this way of writing it, right? It's just the usual equality. I'm even going to write things like T1 different than T2 instead of the negation of T1 and T2, right? And I'm going to use just our usual uh, mathematical notations instead of this prefix uh, notation. This Keeping in mind that, of course, I have a good way of translating each of the formulas I'm writing here into this one, right? But um, I might sometimes even write this with a parenthesis like here, like this, right? Or put parenthesis in case we need to uh, make an ambiguous a given formula, knowing that this have always a correlation uh, in my prefix notation, right? But for the for the rest of the course, I'm going to write just formulas that we can, of course, read easily, right? Knowing that they they correspond to formulas in this prefix notation. Okay, so this is going to be always uh, a convention. Um, right now, let me give you the example. Perhaps I can give it here. Suppose I I take um, this this formula. Again, perhaps uh, consider in the language of rings, uh, the L ring formula, uh, there exists an X, X times Y equals um, one, and x equals zero, okay? So in this, in this formula, even if I'm, I'm, I'm using x in, in, in two different uh, parts of the formula and one of them has a occurrence which is free and the other is not, right? This quantifier kind of goes up to here, right? But this occurrence of this variable is going to be free. Perhaps let me write it this in. This occurrence, this is a free occurrence. Uh, 
and this one is not, right? It's not free. So the same variable can occur sometimes free and sometimes not free in, in the same formula. And the fact is that this is a subformula, and in this subformula, this subformula starts with this quantifier, so this occurrence is not free. But this formula, this sorry, this variable is not in a subformula which starts with there exists an X, right? If, if you want to see it like this. Okay, some some of the variables might appear. Uh, free and in the same formula, the same variable might appear not free. So in this, in this example, nevertheless, the set of free variables of my formula, if this is my formula phi, right? Then the set of free variables is still X and Y. Even if X appears in some of these variables uh, as not a free variable, yes. I, I could put parentheses like this, right? If you want. If I write, note yeah. that this is. Uh, well, right. If, okay. Let, 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 let me put you. Let me put you the. If you want, this is. Okay. I mean, this is this is and anyway. This is a definition that should go with the prefix notation, right? This is something that actually happens is when I write the formula. I don't know. I guess it should be something like this, right? Um, equal times uh, x, y, um, one equal x and zero, something horrible like this. And when I apply, I mean, this is intended to be exactly this formula where I needed to use parentheses to make unambiguous the way we're, uh, we're organizing the formula. But when I apply this definition to this uh, formula, then I know that the first, this occurrence is uh, an occurrence which is not free, and then on the other hand, it's an occurrence which is free. Okay, we put parentheses and we know it's very easy to know when a variable is really in the scope of a quantifier or not. Okay, uh, yes, you are doing like the, the joint of two, two things, but if you put the parentheses, this is the otherwise, this is the joint, right. Yeah, that's correct if i if i well if i put the parentheses like like this that's correct yeah, then no, no. non-occurrence is free yes well you you have you have you have this conjunction and then this conjunction only applies to phi m side there is a unique readability so there is, there is no way in which you can interpret this in two different ways, right? This is the, the magic of this pre prefix notation is that there is no way you can have this ambiguous. We need for parentheses to make this unambiguous precisely because it's not in the prefix notation, okay? Um, good. Now, exactly the way uh, we did with, um, with terms, we need to see also a formula that has some free variables, perhaps in a bigger ambient set of variables. Yes. How do you um, rigorously define sub formula? Because if, it, if it's just any sub word, which that's uh, a, like that's a very good uh, question. It has to be a sub word which is uh, a formula, and you have to do it in. Isn't x equal zero a sub like even in the prefix notation you, like. Yes. Wherever we put the print, however we arrange our, I mean, so in either case, I mean, we have different uh, words according to where the parentheses are in the prefix notation. That's correct. But in either case, we have the subword x equals zero. That's correct. Actually, you have. So you have in this in this one you have those sub formulas, x times y equal one, x equals zero, and there exists x sorry there exists x x y equal one right and finally the whole formula is a sub formula if you want right Oops. those are all, all the sub formulas of this formula here and um 
if there is a sub formula, but, right? But uh, now, now the parentheses are other. Oh, not, right. the, the answer is you put the figure in this body, and then you apply the lemma of the unique unity, uh -huh. and you look for all the sub formulas that contain your, your variable. Exactly. One of them is that, is that variable. Exist yeah. x. There is none. That's exactly uh -huh. how it is. Okay. Exactly. If there is one of them which starts with there exists an x, then this occurrence is not free, right? If I put the variables, if I put the parentheses now as they are here, right, then this is this is the other subformula. And now there is a subformula in which this subformula starts with there, there exists an x and it binds my, my variable. If I put them the other way, right, if I put them like this, this formula does not start with there exists an X, right? In in this way of writing, yes, but not in this way, right? This will start with a conjunction because the principle quantify, uh, let's say that the, the principle logic connective of this formula is the conjunction instead of the, there exists an X. Like, like the top level. Like the top level, exactly. And notice that this top level is precisely the first symbol that appears in a formula when I write it in prefix notation, right? And then this is, Make it more clear if we just see the true representation of the formula, then it's just anything that is I, I agree. Below, below the I agree. We can we can see it like this, but I, I totally agree. This prefix notation is precisely the tree representation, if you want. You can see it as there is a conjunction. This conjunction is between here I have directly just this atomic one, right? And this here I have a there exists an X, right? Here I have just this formula, right? And this is the kind of the tree attached to this formula here, right? Where my leaves of my tree are just atomic formulas, right? And now you look at the tree, if in a branch of this occurrence, right, I end up in an existential quantifier at some point, then this occurrence is binded or not free. And uh, if not, this is free, right? In this case, this occurrence of X, well, in, in this uh, branch of my tree, I have at some point the existential quantifier, and this is not free. But in this branch going upward, I don't have any existential quantifier, and this is free, right? This is exactly the same definition as, as the one I gave here uh, for the prefix notation. That's correct. And actually, this. This way of doing this tree is precisely how you get the unique readability if you see the proof. It's essentially writing a term in this tree formation. Good? Okay. Now, I was saying um, exactly as we were doing with terms, we will do with formulas, which is uh, trying to declare which is the set of variables I am going to uh, use to treat a given formula. So. Recall for a given term, we were saying, okay, the term might have X and Y as variables, but I could see it as a term in X, Y, and Z, or W variables if I need, even if they don't appear in the actual term. So definition, uh, an L, well, let perhaps like this, let X be a multivariable, X1 of 2XN, an L X formula uh, is an L formula uh, and say phi here is an L formula such that the free variables of phi are among X1 of 2 XN. Okay, so we declare that all the free variables occurring in this phi have to be included in the x1 and xn, and we write this as phi x, right? Just to indicate that I'm treating this formula as an Lx formula, right? So this notation means that phi is a formula, and every free variable that occurs in phi has to be among x1 up to xn, right? So let me give you an example. So example, 
for example, this formula phi, phi is, of course, an L x y formula, but it can also be treated as an L x y z formula, right? Simply just extending the number of variables or the actual multivariable I'm, I'm dealing with it. So I could write something like phi of x, y, z, and the formula that I write here, perhaps it doesn't use z at all, right? Perhaps I write something like exactly the formula I have there, right? x, uh, x times y equals one and x equals zero, right? Even, right. The, the, the formula here never uses the variable z, but this means I'm treating this formula as an x, y, z formula. I'm, I'm going to treat this formula as having still a third variable, even if it does not appear in the formula. Okay. I think this was the last part I needed to tell you about formulas. We're almost finished with this part. I still need to define new, the satisfaction relation. And Perhaps at some point of this part, you will see I I don't understand anything of this course. I have seen since my first year in mathematics uh, structures and formulas, and I of course I know how to interpret a for all. And this person is just telling me how to interpret formulas I've seen in every course in mathematics. I'll try to tell you why are we doing this at all, right? This should have. Uh, some gain at some point and it seems I'm just defining the mathematics you've already learned in the first course of fundamentals of math but we'll gain some <laughs> some insight from this formalism so now satisfy ability so let uh, m be an L structure Phi of x uh, with x equals to x1 up to xn and L formula. So this is the same as an LX formula, but I already write it like this. Uh, and let me call it B just in case B be some element in m to the n. Now we define the relation m satisfies the formula phi evaluated at b. Okay, this is the relation I want to define and we define it by the main tool we have is just induction of formulas, right? We're going to define when a structure satisfies or not a given formula and the given formula i'm just going to evaluate it at a given point of my structure okay by induction on formulas so on phi okay so the base step is to define it for phi atomic right we have three cases uh, M defines when this formula is just the formula. Um, well, let me put it like this. If phi is uh, the true uh, formula, then this is always the case. I put it always. If phi is uh, false, this is just never the case this only means m does never satisfy this formula right and we i write this as for the relation they are not in the relation right um if phi is again a relation oops, relation symbol attached to t1 to tn l terms or oh, perhaps let me put here T 
m, right? This this one has nothing to do with the length of my variables. Let me perhaps be precise. So with r, a function symbol, the arity of r is m, and each ti is an lx term, right? Then I define these holds for, perhaps I can write it like this, ti x. Then we define that m satisfies this formula, t1, tn, right, applied to my applied to my uh, tuple B, so evaluated at B, if and only if this B belongs, uh, sorry, not this B, but the image of T1, sorry, T1M applied to B, right? This is an element, recall this is a function that goes from N to M, I evaluated at B, now this tuple, T, M, M of B belongs to the interpretation of the relation. It's not, it, it has to be this way, right? I mean, we... Sorry, again? Exactly. So when, um, here... In, Yes, so when phi is t, this always happens. I mean, this is the same as, as, as saying m satisfies always phi if phi is this one, right? Yeah. I could yeah, yeah. I could write here phi is, is, yeah. is the same, right? When, yeah. when phi is this formula, this is always satisfied. Yeah. Doesn't matter, I, I could put here the b, right? Doesn't matter of the b, yeah. right? Sorry, perhaps this is clear. If phi is this formula, this is always satisfied. If phi is this formula, this is always satisfied, right? Now, if phi is the formula, a relation of m terms, then this is satisfied at a point b. If the m terms each are evaluated at b, if this new tuple is a tuple of the interpretation of my relation, right? Is this clear? So I, I still have one more type of atomic formula, which is which one? What was the third type of atomic formula? Equality, Equality right? So if phi is this equal T1, T2, uh, with Ti again, with Ti of x, an L term, uh, then we have that uh, M satisfies this formula phi of B if and only if is if and only if uh, M well if I take the first uh, term and apply it to B it has to be equal to T2 applied to B right and this equality is the, the actual equality. This is not, again, a formal symbol. This is just really saying that two elements in my structure are the same, right? Okay, this is the definition for the satisfaction or the satisfiability relation for atomic formulas, right? This is what we need for the base step and now for the induction, for the inductive step. Um, well, we assume that we already defined this for two formulas, phi and psi. So assume uh, m of, hi, of phi and psi has been defined. Let me write it properly. This relation has been defined for phi 
and psi. And now we define it for for the um, for the new formulas, right? So perhaps I should put it. Let me write it like this: for psi one and psi two. Okay. Oops, psi two. Okay. Now, if phi is of the form the negation of psi one, for example, right? Then we declare that m satisfies phi if and only if what should it be I, if not yes exactly if m does not satisfy psi one right so i satisfy the negation right recall this is the negation this is m satisfies the negation of psi one right precisely when i do not satisfy psi one Right. This is the definition of the negation. But and here I'm using the induction because I already have defined. I know when this formula. Sorry, I should put the b's right. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Now there are two more cases that we need to deal with. The one is the conjunction, right? Mm -hmm. So if phi is psi one, psi two, then M satisfies, oops, M satisfies phi if and only if M should satisfy both, right? And finally, we need the, the case of the existential quantifier. Let me check how exactly did I put it here? Right. And you don't have to assume that M satisfies both the I mean, you're totally right. What I need to assume is that this is has been defined. Sorry, has been defined. Right? It's, it's not that I, I assume that they satisfy it, but that this relation has been defined. Right? It's not. So I define when this holds for for B or does not hold. Right? I'm not assuming, of course, that they are satisfied. Otherwise, this. <laughs> Makes no sense, right? Okay, perhaps. Oh, right. Thank you. Okay. Here, I, I also need the B. Thanks, because I'm taking. So we can't believe this. Uh... Sorry. So we can't believe this. Uh, that you define them and then you apply to B. And... Exactly. That's exactly. Actually, actually, I have defined for. I should write this perhaps differently, right? Assume the relation, this relation, right, has been defined for psi one of x, psi two of x, and any b, right? Any b in M to the n. This is a bit better, right? This is what we have done, right? Now, the last case is the following. We assume, uh, so suppose phi is of the form, mm, there exists a y, uh, let's say, theta of uh, x, y with uh, or where uh, we have defined this relation for all, uh, let me put it like this, B comma C, perhaps A 
in m to the n plus one, right? N theta, sorry. Sorry, for, for theta of x, y, and uh, b comma a in m n times m. Here I'm taking y just a single variable. Okay. So if i is of this form, note that this does not say it only says that y is among the free variables of theta, but perhaps it doesn't have it, right? It it, it can happen that this formula contains Why did you say among the free variables? Right. You, you can say among the variables. Among well. Definitely, but but if if this is among already the 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 I mean if this variable for example is does not appear free appear appears free, then this quantifier is basically doing nothing, right? I'm applying a quantifier for a variable which does not appear, right? It, it could happen. I mean I can write silly formulas like something like let me write one. Silly formula, I like uh, there exists Z such that X equals X. I mean, I can't write things like this. I'm quantifying a variable which does not appear in my formula. This is kind of silly, but nevertheless a variable, right? But I, the only thing I'm saying is that this Z, I'm, I'm treating this formula as an X Z uh, formula. Just to be sure that, uh, this y at least can be among the free variables of my uh, formula y, uh, formula theta. And you write... I mean, this won't happen in, in practice, right? I, I assure you that I won't write things like this in practice, but technically this is also a formula, right? It's a silly one, but it could happen. That's correct. This can happen as well, right? I, I could be very silly and write even there exists x, there exists x, x equals x, <laughs> right? This, this second one is doing nothing, but this is also a formula formally, right? I mean, I, this is still a formula. Yeah, but if you write for all x, there x is x, x equals to x. For all, all, something like this? Right. This I, I can also write, but this second quantifier is doing absolutely nothing to this formula as the way we're going to define the truth relation or the satisfiability relation. And in practice, we will never see this in this course <laughs> anymore, right? But we have to be just a little bit careful with the definition. This is, this is allowed. This, this is allowed. Happen. This is allowed. Yes, this can happen, but it won't change anything for the satisfiability of this formula. You can delete the for all and with the for all and the satisfiability will be the same. So if we have a formula of this form, then we say that M satisfies uh, phi of B, right? This is just saying that it satisfies this by definition, right? This is just the, there exists Y theta of uh, B, Y, right? I'm just replacing the B in my formula. This is precisely if there is some element A in M such that M satisfies theta of B A, right? I mean, it's intended to 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 mean what you what you do you think it should mean, right? There exists a Y such that this formula holds means precisely that there has to be an element in my uh, set, in the universe of my structure, such that this formula holds. And if the quantifier were, was this silly quantifier, right? If, if, if this is, for example, the formula like this, right? And I'm evaluating this, this is my phi of uh, x, right? Of course, this formula is going to be true if and only if there is an element y such that this is true for an element B, but you see that you can take any element uh, of your structure is going to be. Can we do the other example? Of course. 
Well, I haven't defined what for all is, but you already yeah, guess, we, of course. Let me let me give you. Let, let, let's do this formula, right? Actually, well, in this case, okay. Let, let me write it like this, right? This is the formula you said for all x, there exists an x such that uh, x equals x, right? No, wait. two x's. No, x equals two x. So something like like this, right? Two x, right? And in the language of language of rings, right? Then Right, exactly. Then let, let, let us try. This this should be, I mean, or the language of groups. No, oh, here we, no, we have rings, right? You're multiplying here, I guess. Oh, but you can take x plus x. Ah, okay. Then let's write x plus x in the language of, let's say, additive groups. Or perhaps let's keep it multiplicative, right? Then uh, suppose we have a group, right? Let G be a, a group as an LG structure, right? And we want to check what does it mean for this group to satisfy this. If it does satisfy or not this this sentence, right? Let me for the quickly say what what this is stands for, where for all x is an abbreviation of not exist x not. Okay, this is exactly what the meaning of for all means. Right. Okay. It, it it will be in for all. I can ensure you that it will at the end of the day. This means exactly for all. Right. So this holds if and only if. Right. If I follow the definition, this holds if and only if for every b in uh, G, it holds that G satisfies. There exists x, x equals x, x. This formula applied to b, right? But this formula has no free variables, right? So this b won't appear at all in this, in the satisfiability of this formula, right? This holds if and only if there is, there is some, let's say now a in g such that now G satisfies the formula, there is, uh, sorry, X equals X, X, now applied to A and B, but this A is, is the one intended for the X, right? And this is if and only if, well, there exists A in G such that A, equals to a times a where now here this is the actual group operation right and this is true because this is true for the identity for example of the group so this actually holds in any group this formula even if it is a strange looking formula with a quantifier two quantifiers with the same right so again if, if you check this this formula and this formula are basically the same and we won't attach two quantifiers with the same variable later in this course. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Question. Yes. Uh, what you have erased already on this part. Yeah, sorry. Place when phi x equals to exist there exists x theta. There exists y theta x y. Let, let, let me write it here again. I'm sorry, I, I delete the definition I was giving. So this the definition was when phi is to exist a y such that theta of x y, right? This means look that this this is the the main logical quantifier in this formula, right? So this means every occurrence of y 
actually is bind to this quantifier. So why is, for example, not a free variable of this formula, right? So in particular, we still have that the free variables of y of this formula phi are among x1, xn, right? Which are just these ones. And this is the, the way we were so dealing with phi. You don't know, ask, this is important. The induction is on, the induction is on the form of phi, right? On the complexity of phi. Exactly. 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 You can you can think of if you think of, about the tree, perhaps this is this is a nice way to. And it's not about the number of free variables. No. Exactly. This is not okay. at all about the number of free variables. Just about the complexity. So the complexity goes. Uh, I have the negation of phi. I have also, sorry, the, the negation of psi one, let's say, this psi one and psi two, and this perhaps there exists y, theta of x, y. And these are all one complexity level above these ones, right? This is, if, if I write the tree, this is like I have psi one, and here I added a new symbol. This is again also the complexity of these two. The complexity of this one is just one above this psi one and psi two, and the same here is just I have here this formula and I go up complexity one, right? If you can, if you want to think about it, we're doing complexity on the uh, um, height of this tree, right? This is the actual complexity we're doing. I mean, when I say complexity on formulas, what I'm doing is actually complex uh, induction on natural numbers depending on the height of the construction of the formula. And in the inductive step, I'm saying, well, if these were of height n, I'm doing height n plus one. And the only three possibilities I have to extend my length of my construction is by putting a negation, by putting a conjunction, or by putting an existential quantifier, right? And these are the three cases we did. OK, good. So now we have finally defined what this what this basically means, right? Perhaps even this, right? This is, those are structures. These are formulas evaluated in a, in a, in a, in a point of my, uh, of my structure. And this is the satisfiability relation. This is structures and these are formulas, right? So what I was uh, telling you before is that you basically, know since first year exactly this, right? You know how quantifiers should uh, be interpreted. You know how conjunctions and negation should be interpreted. Uh, what at all have we gained from these two hours uh, that we have seated on here? One is this idea to show things by the complexity of a, of a formula. And this will be really important for the rest of the, of the course because we are really precisely defining the kind of ob objects we can have here. Perhaps let me let me tell you the difference between right. Let, let me tell you now what, what is this definition of first order. Notice that the quantifiers we're using in formulas are quantifiers that only apply to elements of G. For example, if you want to write a formula for saying that something is a simple group, right? You would need perhaps to say something like every subgroup uh, is either the trivial or the whole group, but you cannot quantify over subgroups because the quantifiers only quantify over elements of your group. So these quantifications that you do in usual mathematics, like for every group, for every subgroup is either the whole thing or the trivial group. Well, this is not exactly allowed to say it in a formula. You cannot put quantifiers like for every subset of your structure. This is not allowed. So if you go, if you want to have formulas that quantify or over subgroups, you need to go to higher languages. And this is not going to be any more first order. But if you go to higher languages, then you're going to lose some of the properties I'm going to give you in the second part of the course. So having this to only bind elements of your structure, these quantifiers only to apply to elements of your structure. So for all, for every element of G 
or for every element of a ring A, this is going to help us or this is going to have a special properties that we're going to use in the second part. When you go higher or more expressive languages, then you're going to lose some of these tools. You're more expressible, but you lose some of the nice tools we're going to have in first order. So, right, we, this kind of a balance between how much you can express, uh, perhaps you can express more in, in higher uh, order languages, but suddenly you, you're going to have not so nice theorems uh, about this, uh, about these languages and about, well, th this model theoretic uh, theorems that we're going to see in, in the second part. And um, right, this induction of formulas is going to help us uh, quite a lot. So usually, you know, of course, how to, to, to know when a formula, well, at, at least interpret how, what does it mean for a formula to fold in a structure, but here we're fixing exactly what kind of formulas we're trying to deal with, right? We're not just taking any formula that you can say for a group, but very restrictive ones. And studying exactly one class of formulas for a given structure is, is, is what is going to be important for us. Um, not just studying the one group and everything that you can express on, on, on such a group, but just really restricting to a, a specific class of a set of formulas that, that you can write. And this is perhaps which, what is important. So, um, right, I mean, in, 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 in the practice, you will see that, that some, somehow you knew already this very good. I mean, you know for sure how to interpret uh, formulas in mathematics. We're just making this uh, formalism. So in order that we can do, for example, induction on formulas and that this is going to help us to well in a bit to to derive some some nice consequence consequences for for um for the second part of the of the course yes i'm just realizing that i'm not getting what what are what do we really want to say when we talk about satisfaction Satisfying yes. in a higher language, in our higher language, what, what are we really saying? Because I understand that this means that phi of b is true. Correct. Exactly. In a higher language is, is going to be the same, but you could have, for example, this is something that I'm what I'm going to write here is not going to appear anymore in this course. But for example, you could say a given uh let, I don't know, subset a1 up to a n subsets of a given group G. Right, you could write now something like G satisfies a formula about these subsets, saying that I don't know, perhaps this formula says something like A1 and up to AN are normal subgroups, something like this. But this is something that we don't do in first order. This is not first order, we're not going to uh, talk about formulas which can be applied to subsets of. Uh, of structures or of or groups or rings or whatever we're talking about, but really only formulas which apply to elements of the group, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, we can define this, and this is going to be totally fine. I mean, the definition is going to be very much along the definition I gave you for first order formulas, but this is going something to be well of second order, right? Of subgroups of subsets of of my of my set G. And quantifier over subsets uh, is something which allows you. Um, perhaps I will I will give you uh, an example uh, tomorrow of how powerful this is in compared to to this. I mean, in terms of express, uh, expressibility. However, in this part we have uh, very interesting theorems uh, that allows to play a little bit more model theoretic. Um, yes, let me give you an example tomorrow of of of, of the difference between these these two. Um, I have right. a very simple question. I am, yes. So what is the role of the true and false? They don't interact with the other end. That's that, that, that's true. This is going to be this is going to be useful just when um yeah, this is this is basically this is a trick to have an atomic formula which is true in all models. You have, for example, that this formula. Right. This is a formula which 
actually can be it, it's a formula in every language right because this is a formula in the empty language it only it, it only uses variables and equality and this is a formula which is true actually in every structure doesn't matter which structure you take since we uh, assume that every universe of a structure was non-empty this is a formula which is true in every structure right uh, the same is basically this this is the same for the truth but uh, taking an atomic formula okay this is it's not going to be that important I'll, when when we arrive to the application where perhaps i use this you will see which is the place i'm using it but it's not going to be um, uh, a big deal actually in what follows so you could take if you want to forget this is an atomic formula you could take t just to be this formula and the false would be the negation of this formula, for example, right? I know I'm a bit foolish because when you wrote that, these are the, the logical symbols and you wrote a list of yes. symbols. Yes. Uh, for example, you didn't include it ah, for all very the good. Things, but it does, I guess it's redundant. Yes. Let, 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 let me write our convention for the rest of the. So, convention. We write. Also, uh, phi implies psi, phi or psi for every x, phi, right? What else? Phi if and only if psi for abbreviations of formulas, but I'm going to use these symbols in what follows uh, as we do in mathematics. So this is going to be, so those are abbreviations of let me write in uh, like this. This is going to be not by uh, right. This one, for example, this is abbreviation for this one. Uh, this is an abbreviation for not exist, not uh, phi. Um, this is an abbreviation for uh, not phi in uh, uh, sorry and not psi right yes and this is now that i have abbreviated this one this is just phi implies psi and psi implies phi right this so, so my question was what what why do you did you include the, the false the full symbol in that list of symbols instead of defining it as Right. Well, I, I need negation for sure. Negation, I, I, I really want it. I meant false. Ah, right. You, you, you're right because, well, it is the same point, right? I would like to have an atomic formula which is false and an atomic formula which is true, and then negation, negation of true is not already is not anymore atomic, right? So I wanted a formula which is atomic and which is true in all, and one which is false in, in every structure. Um, but I agree, there are formulas which are uh, equivalent to these ones. Um, and well, the, the problem is that they're not atomic, right? Correct. Um, yes. And the system building uh, upon, uh, so if you exclude false and only with true and all this, this other, yes. maybe the, then it will evolve into totally different system. No, not not really, not really. So the 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 it. Exactly, it won't it won't make a, a huge difference later on. I will try to spot the point where I might use this uh, later in the course, but usually, actually, you can totally forget about truth and false and just work with the uh, uh, negation, uh, conjunction, and the existential quantifier. Actually, I could have done, I could have write the the. The alphabet in using all these symbols, right? Negation, uh, right? I could have just write my formula saying that all these are these symbols and write the induction definition for using all these symbols. The, the, the reason why I did not do this is that then my induction step is very large. I need to prove one induction step for this symbol, another for this one, for this one, for this one, for this one. And this is, well, very large. In this very short uh, case where I only added, well, I also the truth and the false if you want. 
in this in this case where I I only had these three symbols for the um, inductive step, this is kind of very reduced. I reduced my inductive step, and this is basically proving still things for implication, uh, disjunction, and the for all quantifier. Right? This is the only reason. But when we're going to write formulas, of course, we're going to use uh, also the universal quantifier, also implication, disjunction, and so on. Okay. It's just that when proving things by complexity of formulas, we are reduced to a very small set of uh, symbols for the inductive step. Okay. Good. This is a good uh, a good point. Okay. Let Let's perhaps say a couple of things, expressing things. Perhaps this is a what can what can be expressed. Just in the empty language, this is perhaps uh, informative. What, what, ah, right, sorry. Let me give you a definition. Lastly, this is a definition. Uh, an L sentence is an L formula. without free variables, okay? And then since I have no free variables, the, the relation that, that I just, uh, so if pi is an L sentence, so I have no free variables, this means that I don't need to evaluate it at any point on B. Right? This is just a sentence. It says something about my structure, and this is going to be satisfied or not. Then this holds, or this does not hold. Okay, this a sentence is just something that I don't need to evaluate uh, in any point of my structure. It has it has no free variables, right? Let me give you examples. Examples in, in the language of groups. In the language, language of groups, I can have, um, let me have phi to be uh, for every x, there exists a y such that x times y equals one, right? Know that there are no free variables in this, in this formula, right? And actually this is a formula, a sentence, sorry, that is actually true in every group, right? Because by definition, well, you have an inverse for every element, right? You can have also other formulas, for example, this one. Right? So this is again a, a sentence, right? Because it has no free variables. And you can decide if it is true or not, satisfied or not in a given L structure. If your L structure is a group, well, this is true. Of course, if and only if your group is a billion, and not if not, right? So those are then any group satisfies uh, phi, but only, I mean, this is a triviality, right? Only billion groups satisfy. my sentence, sentence psi, right? So now I want to, I want to know what can be expressed in, with a sentence in the language, in the empty language. What can you say about a structure in the empty language? Any, any guess? Not a lot, <laughs> but you can say things. Any guess? Tautology is all the ideological qualities or something like that. Right. A, a tautology is a, a sentence which is going to be true in every structure. This is by definition, right? But this is something like of the form, right? This this is an example of a tautology. Or if you want, you can say a tautology is something. Um, well, let me say it like this: just a tautology is something which is true in every 
in every structure. This is, of course, something that you can say there exists one element. But you can say there exists x, there exists y, x different from y. Exactly. So you can say there are at least two elements, right? In general, you can you can you can say there are at least n elements. This sentence we can say. It says uh, there exists one, there exists two, there exists oops, x n. And let me already introduce a, a, a notation. Let me put here something like this, xi different from xj, where this, 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 this big uh, conjunction of these formulas is just a annotation, right? J uh, stands for x1 different than x2 and x1 different than x3 and like this for every for every possible oh sorry this was i different than j for every i different than j right right it's just a big big conjunction but a finite one right this this says uh, m has at least well let me write it This is phi, right? And then the structure M satisfies phi if and only if the cardinality of M is at least N, right? Can we say a little bit more? Can we say, for example, there are exactly N? This is also possible, not very difficult. But we can also say the structure M has exactly n elements right uh, the formula let, let, let us write actually let us give a okay it doesn't matter let me let me put it there exists x there exists x2 up to there exists xn i say that all these elements are different right and for every y y has to be here I put a disjunction. Y has to be equal to one of these xi's, right? Here I'm notice that here I'm using already just all the symbols that I was supposed not to use, perhaps, or that, that, that are abbreviations, right? I'm using uh, conjunctions. Uh, well, those are allowed. Here I'm using a, a disjunction, and here I'm I'm using a for all. And here again, this is just an abbreviation. Y is not all right. It's equal to xy. This is just an abbreviation. Stands for what do you expect, right? Just y equals x1 or y equals x2 or y equals xn. If you write, in, you express this like uh, uh, there exists bigger or equal than an element, and then you negate. Or bigger or equal than n plus one. Is, is it formally the same thing uh, if you remove the abbreviation, or is it different? I, I mean, the formula is going to be different, but uh, the formula is going to be different. The formula is going to be different, right? But in a structure, this one and your formula are going to define exactly the same, the same thing, right? I mean, I, it's going to be uh, right. Both both are going to be equivalent in every structure, so. Uh, what I'm saying is that is there a name for formulas that are equivalent in every structure? I, I I will say this 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 in a moment. So we say we can we can define it. So two we say definition definition two formulas right <laughs> two formulas. Um, no, oh, first let, let 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 me put it not for formulas but for sentences and then we extend it. Let, let me put it like this. Okay, we extend. We extend the satisfiability relation. To formulas, so. Uh, by declaring or by defining. That. Um, 
m satisfies a formula phi of x. So now this is a formula. It, it has three variables, right? If, if I put instead of x a b, we have already defined this relation, right? But if I let it as a variable x, this just stands for m satisfies for all x phi of x, okay? Ah, and where um, if x is a multivariable, we write for all x, or there exists an x, or of course for every x1, for every x2, up to for every xn, and the same here for there exists. Okay, this is just an abbreviation for saying uh, for all, for every uh, uh, variable in my multivariable, and if I put there exists an x, this is just there exists x1, there exists x2, and so on, up to there exists xn, right? So this is the way we define just that a formula is satisfied in M. This is just basically saying that the formula is true in every uh, tuple of my, of my structure. So with this definition, we say the two formulas are equivalent. Yes. This ah this formula is this formula here. This is phi. Sorry, I, I this is my formula phi. It says there exists x1, x2 up to xn such that they're pairwise different, right? And why is it only two? Okay, well, let's let's see it. Suppose, perhaps I can do it. I'm going to erase this one for the time being, okay? No, okay, let me do it here. So suppose you have a structure that satisfies this phi, right? This is by definition, right? M satisfies the existing one, there is this, exists xn and this big conjunction, right? Right? And this uh, formula phi actually is uh, um, any, any L empty sentence can be expressed like this way. This, arbitrary absolutely, way. because this is this is this is a formula in the empty language. It only uses equality. It uses no relation symbol or function symbol mm -hmm. from the language. Yeah, so it's an arbitrary formula because the empty language is included in every language, right? So this is a formula that can be, uh, I mean, this is a formula for any language, right? So I can take any structure and see if this formula does hold or does not hold uh, in my structure. And well, we can go here by uh, just apply the satisfiability relation to inductive definition, right? This formula holds if there exists there is some A in M, right? Such that now M satisfies uh, there exists X2 up to Xn. All these Xi dependent Xj, I dependent J, and this applied to A, right? Let me call actually this A1, right? This is just the definition of the existential quantifier, the first existential quantifier. If I do this n times for this, all these quantifiers, right? I, uh, I end up saying that n satisfies this formula. I take all these quantifiers, sorry. This is, there are a1 up to an in mn such that, um, M satisfies now this conjunction <laughs> applied to A1 up to AN, right? And if now we see what this conjunction says, right? I need to basically replace each AI for the variable XI and say what this formula says. But this formula says that their pairwise different, right? So this means that this tuple 
is a tuple where none of uh, two coordinates are equal, right? So this means that I have at least n elements in my structure. You agree? Right? And conversely, this, this is actually an Ethereum leaf. If I, if I know I have at least n elements in my structure, then for sure I have a tuple of these n different elements in my structure, and then this formula is going to be satisfied. Right? This one. Now, this one says the first part is the same, right? It says there are at least n elements because I can find n elements which are going to be pairwise different. And the second part says for any other element, it has to be one of these first n, right? This other element y has to be either equal to x1 or either equal to x2 or either equal to xn. So this new formula, let, let's call this formula psi, m satisfies psi if and only if the cardinality of m is exactly n, right? Psi is also in the, uh, in the language. Absolutely, language. absolutely. It uses only equality, none other relation or function sigma, right? Okay. So at least in the empty language, we can say if the, the size of a structure, if it is finite. We can also say with an infinite number of these formulas or sentences that the structure is infinite, at least, right? If it satisfies this formula phi n for n equal two, three, four, and so on, a structure that satisfies all these formulas is going to be infinite, right? I'll ask you a, a question. Do you think there is a formula one formula in the language, in the empty language, that expresses that my structure is infinite. This looks a little bit more difficult, right? We're going to see that this is not possible. <laughs> we cannot, we cannot, we cannot take. Uh, I mean, there is not going to be a single sentence that expresses the property of being uh, infinite in the empty language, okay? Okay. We have 10 minutes. Let me see if we can, I mean, it's usually up to, right, we, we go to half past one in the schedule, but perhaps we can end up today a little bit earlier uh, since I, I, I think it's better if we digest all this, uh, slowly and we go uh, right easy on 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 the definitions for for one day uh, uh, ah right i was going to write the, the before this question i was going to give you the definition of what in, what it means for two formulas to be equivalent right i have been saying something about the equivalence but i haven't defined this property In the empty language with a single formula, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But and the I, I, I ask you the same question. Let, let, let's have this question in, 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 in mind. Let's have it, uh, I mean, let's have it in mind. Perhaps, perhaps we can, we can already see that there are some, well, okay, let, let, let's have these questions in mind because if I, if I give you already answers, then I might spoil a little bit. Let, 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 let's think in the following languages. Can, is there an L sentence? Phi in the following languages. Uh, so in the language of groups, let's say, let's put first the empty language, uh, the language of groups and the language, this language, the language of, uh, just this is just a binary symbol. This is just uh, the relation and the parity of this relation is two, okay? This is a language, it only has a binary symbol, okay? 
The question is, is there a sentence phi in the following languages such that for every L structure, right? M, M satisfies phi if and only if M is infinite, right? Its cardinality is bigger than LF0. Question. Perhaps we can answer this question uh, later in the in the course. But it's, it's good to think about it before I give you perhaps some answers. Right. So this is the definition of definition of equivalence. So we say two L formulas. are equivalent uh, if for every structure M, ah, two formulas, sorry, I didn't write, didn't write the formulas, phi and psi are equivalent if for every structure M, M satisfies this new, this new formula. Okay. Then you can prove uh, Javier's theorem is that the formula, um, the formula expressing this formula, there exists X1, Xn, such that they are all different, right? And for every y, y is equal, equal to some of them, right? We, we were saying this formula should express that the structure has exactly n elements. This is equivalent to, to the formula phi n and not by n plus one, where phi n is, oh, I deleted, where phi of n is just this form. There exists x1, there exists xn, such that xi is different than xj, or i and j different, right? This is uh, totally simple, right? I mean, this formula is saying that you have at least n elements, and this is saying that you don't have uh, n plus one uh, elements, right? So you need to have exactly n. So these two formulas, uh, even if they're different as formulas, they they are still equivalent in any in any in any L structure. Okay, let me recheck if, if there was something I, I forgot. Okay, the last definition and, and we're done for today. Two structures, two L structures. M and N are said to be elementarily equivalent. And we write this like this. If for every L sentence, but without free variables, Phi, we have that M satisfies phi if and only if N satisfies phi. So the two the two L structures satisfy exactly the same L sentences. Okay. Um, right. Think of 
I mean, I, I think this is part of the, this is, this is one of the ex exercise in, in exercises in the, in the um, exercise set that I'm, we're going to put in the web page is that if I'll write it here, uh, perhaps, perhaps which one, perhaps here I have space exercise. If for the, well, th this is not, not, not actually necessary, but let me express it for the moment like this. If the language is finite, so I only have finitely many relations, finitely many function symbols and constants. And um, M is finite as well. I have a finite L structure, is a finite L structure. Uh, then there is an L sentence. Let me delete this exercise. There is an L sentence phi such that for any other L structure N, if N satisfies this sentence, then these two structures are isomorphic. So basically we're saying, if I have a finite structure in a finite language, there is one single sentence that characterizes this structure up to isomorphism. Okay, so in a sense, we're saying uh, the, the first order language, this, the, 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 the things that we can express in first order logic for finite structures allows us to characterize them completely up to isomorphism. And we're going to see that this is definitely not the case for infinite structures, right? For finite structures, this is actually doable. You can think of this exercise as follows. Think of a group. If it is a finite group, then what does completely characterize the group in a finite manner? I mean, what do what, what you give me to, to, to present me the group, to, to tell me which group is? The multiplication table and basically what you're going to do in this exercise is to write the multiplication for the, the multiplication table in a formula and this you're going to do this not just for well when you have a multiplication but when you have a relation or when you have other function symbols and you're going to basically try to express this in a single formula that is going to define you the isomorphism okay so we say that first order is not too expressible, but at, at least for finite structures, it expresses completely the isomorphism type of a, of a finite structure, of a finite structure. And for infinite structures, we're going to see, to see that this is not going to be possible, but this is going to be the content of, of tomorrow's course. Okay. I think we can stop for, for today. This is isomorphic. Yes, sorry. This is my my. I I I, I don't think I I introduced. Sorry. This is my notation for isomorphism and equivalence is these these three things, right? So in in particular, this is saying that uh, for finite structures, for finite L structures. Equivalence implies, actually, this is going to be an if and only. For finite structures, being equivalent or being isomorphic is, is the same. But for infinite structures, for sure, not. It's not going to happen, OK? This is, a, the, I mean, the exercise is, is showing you basically this, OK? At least this arrow. The other arrow is 
if I'm not mistaken, another exercise of the exercise set, okay? To know that isomorphism should preserve the truth, okay? The satisfiability relation. This definition, uh, it's not the equivalent. Equivalent, yes. Implies that so okay if this is so then uh then uh we change phi into l formula also also holds right right if if the definition of 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 phi of satisfying phi is just something satisfying for all x phi of x but what does not hold is that i mean here I cannot have a formula. I mean, if, if what you mean is that something like, for example, if I have a formula like this and, and evaluate it at some B, I have no idea what should this be. I mean, this has, of course, no meaning here because I have no idea if B is some tuple from this structure. This has no meaning at all, right? This is This is just incorrect, right? So, this is why we just define these four sentences, which are formulas which has which have no free variables, right? If you, of course, if you declare now to to have these four formulas, we said that this is the same as as this one, right? And then this is just again a sentence, and, and basically we're this is already captured by this definition. This answer your your question? Yes, that's already there. If you want, right, exactly. Because we said that the definition of satisfying this formula as a formula is the same as satisfying this sentence, which has no more free variables, right? But beware that this is something different as satisfying the formula evaluated at a point, right? I mean, this is satisfying the formula just as a formula, right? And this means just that it satisfies for, for every x Right, and this is something different. This is something else as evaluating a given formula at a point. This is different than evaluating phi at a given particular point B. Right, these two things are very much different. They're not equivalent. Right, this is something which holds for every possible uh, in, um, evaluation at a, at a point B, and this is the evaluation at the particular point B, right? Okay. Yes, this was this clear? Okay. Any other question?